Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for participating in the special Omics Seminar Series 6. Today, we are very excited to have Dr. Michael Gerner from uh, University of Washington. And briefly, Dr. Gerner graduated with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He went on to receive his PhD in immunology in 2009 from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. He completed his postdoctoral training at the National Institute of Health and joined the University of Washington Department of Immunology as an assistant professor in 2015. And his lab is studying inflammation overall. And uh, basically uh, he describes it as immune system is very complex and it's composed of a large area of innate and adaptive cell populations. And each of which plays a unique role in the host protection. And research in his lab actually uses cutting edge technologies such as microscopy to investigate how these diverse cell types work together collectively to give rise to a response. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Michael Werner. It's all yours. Great, thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. Is it visible? Great. Uh, thank you kindly for the invitation uh, to present our work here. This is an exciting seminar series and I'm uh, very proud and honored to take part of, uh, uh, of this series. Um, so today we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about imaging the immune system and the work we've done in the field. Let's see. There we go. So uh, as Ahmed mentioned, my lab's interests lie in really understanding the role of tissue microenvironments and cell-cell interactions in the generation of immune responses. And we utilize and develop uh, image analysis tools to study tissue patterning and cell-cell crosstalk directly in vivo, which is of course the major theme of uh, this seminar series. Today's talk will focus on uh, describing some of the approaches we've used over the years for imaging the immune system. And I uh, would like to also finish on demonstrating a couple of examples why tissue microanatomy matters with respect to immune cell um, uh, uh, interactions and immune responses. So why, why does positioning matter? Well, immune cells exchange information with one another all the time. First of all, I think everybody knows that there are many types of immune cells and they communicate with one another con constantly. So if you think about an infected macrophage here, for example, at a barrier tissue site, it's going to secrete multiple uh, chemokines to recruit additional innate cell populations that are going to come into the tissue. They're going to provide additional host protection through innate mechanisms. At the same time, you're going to get induction of another types of responses by antigen presenting cells called dendritic cells that are going to migrate to the lymph nodes and interact with naive T cells that, of course, are going to then uh, through information exchange between these dendritic cells and naive T cells are going to generate a large uh, adaptive immune response. And so through clonal expansion and uh, cellular differentiation, some cells are going to become one type of a helper cell. For example, uh, the T follicular helper cell that's going to provide additional information to B cell responses to generate those important antibodies that protect us from uh, microbes or travel to different sites to the barrier tissues, for example, to then talk to the infected macrophages and then instruct them on how to better eliminate the pathogens that have invaded the body. So this is a constant cross talk between many, many, many different layers of immune cells and across multiple tissues. All of this occurs across the body and immune cells in particular reside and initiate many of their responses within lymphoid tissues. So this is a, a confocal microscopy image of a mouse lymph node um, where we've stained the tissue with uh, many different markers. We, in the laboratory, we utilize 10 to 13 parameter spectral confocal microscopy. And here you can just see the intricate organization of various immune cells. So here are your B cell follicles, 
where you can generate antibody responses. This is a T cell zone. It's populated by many different flavors of additional innate cells, and you can see they live in intricate arrangement patterns. You have stromal rich regions around the periphery that promote lymphatic drainage and additional information exchange. In addition, lymphocytes within the lymph node, when they enter the tissue, they must constantly scan this tissue to be able to find their cognate antigens. So T cells and B cells, for example, move constantly to survey the environment at a speed of one to three cell bodies per minute. So this is constant motility promotes detection of threat and interaction with uh, antigen presenting cells. Different migratory behavior patterns are seen for innate cells, and you can see structural organization of medullary macrophages and subcapsulary macrophages here, as well as dendritic cells. So this is intravital to photon microscopy again. And you can see different scanning behavior and motility patterns for these types of immune cells where they're sampling the lymph, and this allows them to efficiently uh, survey that uh, lymph fluid for potential breached uh, pathogens. And when they sense these pathogens, they can capture the information and then process it into a different language that T cells, for example, can understand. And so, and this induces the crosstalk between the, uh, the dendritic cell and the T cell. So here you can see a cluster of uh, activated CD4 T cells, and they're talking to this one dendritic cell. So this is the information exchange happening within the tissue uh, between the innate and adaptive immune system. Now, as I, and at the same time, what you have going on is additional cell types are rapidly recruited from the bloodstream. So here inflammatory monocytes, the, there is an alert state happening within this lymph node and the signals are being sent out to recruit additional innate cell populations that are gonna enter the tissue and provide additional information and support to the ongoing immune response. So it's highly complex organization and motility of the cells and with respect to organization, the way that the cells are organized we think is exceptionally important in this information exchange. The cells don't just randomly migrate through the tissue, but by restricting the cells to certain areas of the organ, this helps the right cells to find one another. For example, dendritic cells and T cells during an inflammatory response engage in cognate interactions within the deep T cell zone. And there are many additional layers of microanatomy that promotes efficient cognate interactions between the cell types. This allows the cells to get activated. They start expressing markers of prolifer proliferative markers. This promotes clonal expansion. And over time, as I alluded to earlier, they move to different sites. And within the lymph node, T cells, activated T cells can migrate to the germinal centers, for example, here, certain areas of the germinal center where they're gonna be providing that help to the ongoing uh, humoral immune response, so making, making antibodies. So ultimately, there is a high degree of organization, and that organization we think is essential for efficient crosstalk and efficient generation of immune responses. So in the lab, we kind of broadly focus on these themes, such as how, where, and where do immune cells get activated, how, where, and when do different cells interact and what kind of information do they exchange among one another? What controls cellular localization at different types of at different times of the immune response? And ultimately, how all of this promotes efficiency in the generation of immune responses. So to be able to study these processes, I've uh, worked on uh, multi-parameter confocal imaging and image analysis, and uh, my journey in this field really goes back to my postdoctoral studies almost more than a decade. And we started this work now ago uh, with uh, Ron Germain's group at the National Institutes of Health. And uh, we, uh, as a postdoc at the time, I developed a technique called, uh, uh, called histocytometry. We were dealing with six to eight parameter uh, uh, confocal uh, microscopy, high resolution imaging data. And we, try to increase the, the multiplexing by several, by including several additional fluorophores. And then I developed a, a couple additional improvements to the technique where we can uh, uh, it, remove fluorescence spillover from spectrally adjacent fluorophores to be able to increase our multiplexing. We were also 
also able to start sort of manually um, classifying pixels to identify specific cell types of interest, for example. So currently we have machine learning to, for tools to detect cell types, but um, at the time we could use Boolean gating to say we would like to visualize population X, Y, or Z. And then to be able to extract these kind of data into the digital domain, which has again now become a fairly common technique, but we were able to generate cellular objects around every single cell within the image tissue. And so here's a, a picture of a dendritic cell with some dendrites, and there are many of these cells within this tissue. And then be able to extract quantitative information then uh, to be able to identify cell populations and ultimately have a quantitative depiction of the, of the tissue. Now, at the time, we were just fascinated by the fact that we could take an image Right, so this was quite a while ago now, and we could take that image and transform that into a plot, what we the histocytometry plot, where we can discriminate different cell types, and that looks very similar to our conventional flow cytometry data. But of course, we have the X, Y, and Z positioning of the data sets within this uh, tissue, and we can gate on regions and be able to quantitatively study composition based and, and localization based on imaging uh, uh, data sets. This is a more recent example of some of our approaches where we essentially utilizing that 13 plex and we can uh, using additional uh, uh, approaches, we can push that spectrum resolution to higher plexing uh, as well, but uh, it allows us to do more complicated gating schemes on different myeloid cell types. And you can already just visually see the complexity of this tissue, but we can now study this uh, in a more quantitative defined space. So we can reconstruct uh, uh, tissues, general tissue structure, and then identify each of those populations and uh, as to where they're located within these lymphoid organs. Um, and uh, uh, what we find is, as kind of can be obviously seen by naked eye, is that the different flavors of immune cells, and I'm not going to go into the detail of what these different immune cells are, but they all reside within different spatial microenvironments within this tissue. And if you can put this all together, you can see the generation of these discrete domains or microenvironments. And, and really the focus of much of our research is understanding why this matters. Really, why do immune cells live in these intricate patterns within this tissue and how does that promote efficiency of the immune response? Now, um, in addition to what I just mentioned, a lot of that work is really was really focused on two-dimensional imaging of thin sections and we expanded that by using high resolution tiling to large tissue sections but also the, there are some obvious limitations to section-based microscopy there is a bias there is problematic it's problematic for detection of rare events if there is orientation dependence for non-uniform tissues and if you have structures that are important to your biology that lie just outside of the imaging or the sectioning plane, obviously that becomes an issue. So to circumvent this, uh, we turn to another uh, fastly moving field, which was uh, tissue clearing. And there have been many uh, um, approaches now published uh, for tissue clearing. I think there are over 30 different methods that are uh, being used actively in the community. Um, at the time, we found that many of the uh, most of the published methods generated subpar image quality uh, and also did not allow us to be able to efficiently stain the tissues with the various uh, uh, antibody probes that we were uh, relying on to be able to detect the cell populations. So together with a, a talented uh, research scientist at the National Institutes of Health, uh, Wei Ji Li, we developed a tissue clearing technique uh, called uh, clearing enhanced uh, 3D or C3D. And uh, uh, this has been uh, since then commercialized by BioLegend. Um, and what you can see here is uh, the, uh, the effectiveness of uh, C3D in taking uh, optically opaque tissues and making them uh, uh, reasonably transparent. So you can actually see uh, uh, the, the markings behind the tissue. So they're, they're very clear. Um, and importantly, uh, this technique at the time gave us the ability to get really high, nice, uh, 
high resolution, nice quality images of antibody stained tissues. So here is that lymph node that I was uh, we were looking at earlier now in three dimensions. And what you're looking at are vascular trees here. Uh, so you can see the complexity of the architecture of, of that. These are B-cell follicles and, uh, you know, T-cell zone areas, medullary rich regions, and we're getting really high quality imaging data sets. And really for a pathologist, if you're in the pathology space, so information like this can be really informative for non-uniform tissues, for example, tumors. This would be very interesting to see the, how different microenvironments are generated. Now, this is at the moment non-quantitative, so we were wondering, can we turn this into a, a quantitative space where we can categorize every single cell within the tissue? And uh, the quality of the imaging data was good enough that we were able to perform segmentation on every single cell within, uh, every imaged cell within this tissue and uh, perform 3D histocytometry analysis. And so this was uh, at the time, very exciting for us and a little bit rudimentary maybe right now, but so here we have the full scan of a 3D lymph node here as we're going through the Z, different Z planes. And at the same time, we have the information encoded in digital space. We have a virtual Z plane that's being dragged across the tissue. And as you're doing that different, you, we're looking at different population of cells that we imaged. And you can see that they're dynamically changing. And if you take all of these populations and plot them on an X by Y plot, you can see a recapitulation of the original imaging data. So this is a full 3D quantitative reconstruction of this organ. So that's pretty cool. And it provides a different whole another level of three-dimensional information. And we think, I think it is valuable for rare events and, uh, and, and non-uniform tissues. And, and since then, we've been able to increase the multiplexing to 10 or more parameters to be able to detect multiple different cell populations in these complex tissues. There are some problems with antibody penetration and tissue expansion techniques have been uh, proposed as one way to improve probe penetration to, to, uh, to essentially uh, get through the barriers that we're facing with, uh, with, with C3D approach. But Hello, I, just, I don't want to disturb, but I just want to ask, like, if it's, if, do you take questions now or later? Um, I don't know how things. What are. is the concept? I, I I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. So this simple question for uh, uh, my name is Marius Karika, Matiel. So, uh, just want to ask: Did you use camelid antibodies uh, for? We uh, have uh, right. Uh, that's a great question. So camelid antibodies, for those not aware, they are much smaller in molecular weight. I think they're almost tenfold or maybe not quite that, but anyway, they're they're much smaller than conventional antibodies and the tissue penetration would be uh, uh, theoretically improved. And I, I believe yeah, theoretically, uh, yeah. theoret we, we haven't tested it. I think there are other groups, uh, and I'm blanking on the name right now. There are other groups that tested tissue okay. penetration. Okay. Sorry, I don't want to disturb, just one question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, good question. Also, thank you, Mario, for the question. Uh, <clears throat> also, I think uh, from the audience, if you have questions, you can also put in the chat box right now then you will not forget. Okay, okay, sorry. Thanks. Oh, okay. It's right up to Michael, whether or not you want to take question now or after, so. I'm, I'm happy to go as we go along because it just makes it a much more conversational style technology. Okay. Sorry to talk so fast. Thanks. Um, yeah, so this allowed us to then uh, essentially again perform this quantitative analysis and we were able to extract information about different populations. And these are innate cells, not focused on T or B cells, but these are just purely innate cell subsets. And you can see just even within these innate cell subsets and localized within the T cell zone, which we thought used to think was relatively uniform. In fact, it's not uniform and you have the generation of these complex uh, microenvironments. Um, and uh, really, again, this is what we're trying to understand what those microenvironments are doing and why they're there to begin with. Uh, but it's also important to be able to study this level of complexity. How do we quantitatively analyze these kind of data? So to, to think about why understanding microenvironments are important, I think it's also good to take a step, quick step back and think about biological systems and just hierarchy of information flow in the biological systems. You know, if you think about a cell, it has, it's regulated by genes and it's got, expresses proteins, 
proteins allow it to be a cell in the first place. Then the cells come together in intricate arrangements to generate microenvironments. Then in these microenvironments, they exchange information through proteins or lipids or sugars. And this influences, again, the gene expression. So there's this constant feedback that microenvironments support. Microenvironments, of course, also support the function of tissue and organs, right? If you don't have cells and microenvironments in the right location, your organ doesn't function and disorganization leads to disease. So this is what the, I, to me, microenvironments are where the information exchange is really happening at. Um, oh, well, and that basically recapitulates everything I just said. So, so I think being able to study tissue microenvironments is, is extremely important. So how do we go about doing that? Well, I was uh, lucky to, uh, uh, to uh, work with a talented postdoc in my group, uh, Caleb Stoltzfus, who I think I, be I, I believe is on the, on, uh, in this uh, room at the moment. So I'm uh, happy he's able to join. So when he, he, he recently moved to a different position, but I'm, uh, when he was in my group, he was uh, working on developing uh, advanced spatial analysis tools uh, to be able to uh, understand tissue microenvironments and how they are positioned and distributed within the tissue. And so uh, he developed a, a, a wonderful uh, tool called Cytomap, which essentially is a, a spatial analysis platform that he coded in MATLAB. It's open source and uh, doesn't require any scripting, which was one of the key requirements. Unfortunately, I'm scripting in, unable to implement script personally. So I really wanted something where I could interact with the data personally. And I think that's an, empower, it's, it's an important point for the biologists who don't necessarily want to learn uh, complicated scripting techniques. But essentially what Cytomap does is allows us to examine uh, 2D and 3D imaging data, allows us to analyze cellular heterogeneity, look at cellular positioning, microenvironment organization and composition, and how these microenvironments come together to form tissues. This is the general layout of what the program looks like. We have a interaction uh, window with various menus and buttons. These are the different types of plots that are being generated where you can interact uh, with your data set and also uh, do analysis and dimensionality reduction approaches to be able to study imaging data sets. So, if you go back to this example where we were looking at this lymph node, here I was demonstrating kind of uh, old school hierarchical gating of different cell types based on uh, single uh, or uh, based on these marker expressions. But of course, we know that as you increase the number of parameters, which we're currently trying to do in the laboratory, uh, that becomes a very challenging task. Where is one population begin and another end and which dimensionality space? So in order to do that, the, the current standard in the field is use clustering-based approaches and dimensionality reduction to be able to visualize that. So in Cytomap, we encoded uh, tools for dimensionality reduction and clustering of cell types to examine cellular level heterogeneity. So looking at protein, for example, expression in different cell types. And we have different tools based on, and, and on all of these work a little bit differently. I think most uh, TISNI and UMAP are the most uh, useful approaches for what we've been able to, uh, to in, in some of the studies that at least we've done. And so here you can see the same data set that we manually created, but now uh, automatically clustered and visualized through dimensionality reduction here, and you generate different clusters. And of course, you can then cross-validate how these clusters were generated based on which different parameters, and you can see expression of different biomarkers that was preferentially on one or another uh, cluster type. Um, but so then you get your uh, get your populations, how do you study their organization? And so in order to do that, we used a, a sliding window, essentially neighborhood scanner approach, where you take a neighborhood of user defined dimensions, so we can input a radius, uh, a given radius, and it scans over the entire tissue and analyzes the distribution of different cell populations. Uh, and uh, the, the user-defined radius is very important because it allows you to look at more granular level biology or large-scale general uh, biology, for example, basic organization of the tissues. So by, by looking at all of these different neighborhoods across the tissue, this immediately gives you the power to do several different things. 
Uh, first of all, you can look at what kind of cells prefer to be co-localized in the same in neighborhoods, so associations, or tend to avoid one another. So negatively correlated cells, and this really tells you which cells prefer to live with one another or not, right? And that's a, just a very quick and, and informative approach to understand cellular relationships. Then you can take the different neighborhoods that you've raster scanned and you can cluster them uh, into different region types. So uh, again, neighborhoods are predominantly composed of one cell type or another cell type, and you can cluster them based on the degree of similarity. Um, and these theoretically should represent different region types or microenvironment. And then, of course, we have the XY positioning of these uh, neighborhoods, so then you can use this color code to then have a, 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 a sort of re region type representation of the tissue. And a lot of these approaches are seen in many current uh, spatial analysis techniques that are coming out and have been developed as well. So it's also fun to think of this heterogeneity of different neighborhoods using dimensionality approaches. So here, every dot is a neighborhood and you can see how the neighborhoods start coming together into different clusters and they're color coded based on the clustering region designation that we performed earlier on. And what's also nice to see is that there are these, especially for the UMAP analysis, which puts clusters uh, near each other or further apart from one another based on the degree of similarity, which is different from TISNI, for example, approaches. What you can see is that you can start visualizing uh, transitions or similarities between the neighborhoods. And this, we think, represents some of the tissue structure and how the neighborhoods transition, or at least the cellular representations, more or less uh, uh, different from one another. And of course, we can formally depict a uh, neighborhood. Uh, and microenvironment interactions with one another with a degree of how frequently they're proximal to another microenvironment type. So this kind of a network plot is essentially a quantitative depiction of what microenvironments, of how microenvironments are organized together to generate this tissue structure. Now, we built this tool for both 2D and 3D analysis. So all we have to do now is take that XY raster scanning and extend it to the Z dimension and then analyze uh, in a similar way, right? So you, 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 you basically have this type of a scanning approach. You can again cluster the neighborhoods into different uh, microenvironments and region types. And we've also built up visualization modules to be able to visualize microenvironments not individual cells, but microenvironments and how they're connected with one another in three-dimensional space. And you can see how the, uh, these microenvironments are interconnected with one another. And this, you know, would not be able to, uh, you would not be able to see these connections in two-dimensional space, right? Because you have, uh, or, or, or thin sectional space. And using this 3D analysis approach, we were particularly interested at the time on looking at myeloid cell interactions with different blood vessels. So here we analyze the crosstalk between different innate cell types and uh, three-dimensional blood vessels, generating objects on blood vessels, and analyzing the nearest neighbors of the different uh, cell populations that were present uh, next to these clusters. And what we found was that uh, certain types of dendritic cells were preferentially localized near blood vessels. And interestingly, they were localized in different types of blood vessels. So that you can see uh, they, they, they segregated from one another. So they were not equally mixed along the blood vessels, but they generated distinct vascular associations. And we were able to then plot these in three-dimensional space and, and visualize these preferential vascular innate cell networks that we were uh, studying. And so this raises a lot of questions about why that is, how does that impact the heterogeneity of both the innate immune system, but also the vascular space. There is a lot of heterogeneity in the blood endothelium and whether that's dictated by the local uh, cellular types that are present. Now, just a quick mention that again, we were, we were mainly at the time, uh, currently still relying on uh, a 13plex 
panels, but as, as we all know, the, the field is moving forward into analyzing more and more and more heterogeneity. So single cell approaches in immunology have been transformative in understanding the landscape of various immune cells, and bone marrow, lymph nodes, uh, even within a single population that's highly heterogeneous of different uh, flavors of immune cells or T cell types. And so really we are now trying to push our technologies further to increase the multiplexing. We are, as I, as I said, we predominantly use spectral imaging with detection of all of these different colors. Uh, there is potential to increase that fluorescence space using fluorescence lifetime imaging, but it's not, it, 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 it takes a decent amount of effort. Uh, the obvious benefits of this is that uh, spectral imaging uses off-the-shelf uh, conjugated antibody reagents uh, that are developed for flow uh, and uh, uh, conventional uh, microscopes there, you know, uh, so you can use this uh, in, across various uh, institutions quite easily, and this is relatively quick. Now, there are many, many strategies that are, you know, people are trying to increase the antibody-based Multiplexing, I'm not even going into the depths of uh, spatial uh, transcriptomics work that's obviously has been uh, a revolutionary and developed by many people here. Um, what uh, we are currently focused on is utilizing iterative staining technologies um, to increase, to basically piggyback off of our existing expertise in spectral imaging, but essentially uh, utilize multiple rounds of uh, spectral, spectral reprobing to then each with each round, you know, increasing and increasing our depth of our microscopy. So in particular, we've tested a few of these various approaches here. Uh, um, a recent technique developed by Ron Germain's group, my former postdoc mentor called IBEX, uh, iterative bleaching extends my multiplexity, uh, multiplexity developed by Andrea Radke and his group, uh, utilizes repeated chemical bleach cycles with lithium borohydrate. And just as a sort of, uh, in our hands, we've seen very excellent results with uh, generation of very high quality imaging data with this approach using our conventional workflow that we've already previously established. So uh, this is our current uh, work in progress. Ultimately, this is where we would like to be now. Uh, in the near future is to utilize uh, this high-plex protein imaging with antibodies, fluorescence microscopy, to be able to use uh, tools like Cytomap to be able to understand cell-cell interaction networks and combine this uh, with single-cell RNA sequencing data that we have started flooding our servers and we are trying to dissect the heterogeneity of all the various immune cells. Hopefully we can use these data to inform the types of biomarkers to stain the cells for. But also there are several interesting algorithms that have been developed to analyze cell-cell interactions through receptor ligand analysis. And so you can actually predict what signals the cells are transmitting to one another. And my goal is to utilize this combination approach to then be able to understand what potential interaction pathways are taking place within the tissue. And then we have to couple this with powerful um, uh, functional perturbation studies to be able to understand if any of this stuff matters for the immune response. So we have to still rely on genetic knockouts uh, and tracking of the immune response and immunization or infection systems or tumor studies to be able to see if, if what we predict by computational approaches matters, which is, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a long work in progress. So I would like to now just show you three vignettes, and I'll try to keep it relatively brief, about why we think immune uh, microenvironments matter for the generation of, of responses. So as I, as I talked a little bit about, there's a great degree of diversity in the innate immune system. These are some innate dendritic cell subtypes that have been identified in the mouse, and there are many similar subtypes that have been found in, in humans. And dendritic cells are sentinel cells that are there to detect the uh, microenvironment, sample the microenvironment, and sample infections and understand tissue cues or during cancer, and take that information. And if there's a threat or danger that's being sensed, 
translate into the information uh, to T cells and to instruct the generation of different flavors of uh, T helper cells or cytotoxic T lymphocytes or T follicular helper cells that promote humoral Im immunity. So there's a complexity of heterogeneity in the innate system that translates to the heterogeneity of the uh, of the adaptive immune system. So we are we're really focused on understanding uh, this crosstalk in, in, in the heterogeneity between the two systems. And so uh, what we were, what we, when we started this project and trying to understand immune microenvironments of innate cells, we decided to use a simple reductionist approach of, of visualizing lymphoid tissue and innate cells within lymphoid tissues after administration of different type of inflammatory agonists. So adjuvants either used in the clinic or, uh, or isolated uh, bioactive agonists uh, uh, that induce innate immune responses. Um, and, and, and we asked the question, how do the innate microenvironments change in tissues over time? And how does that impact the generation of adaptive immune responses? So here we're looking at a, a naive lymph node it's relatively small. And one particular thing you can notice is that these green dendritic cells that are very important for induction of T cell activation are localized in the periphery of the tissue. And we think that's important for sampling uh, of information that's being draining via the lymph. Uh, type two adjuvants did not modify this uh, specific cell type distribution patterns. Uh, there are other features that we're now pursuing that are quite interesting, but uh, uh, that's a separate story. But type 1 adjuvants, uh, we found, induces a very rapid reorganization of the immune cells uh, within the tissue. And you can see the green cells now, instead of being very peripheral, are now found within the deep T cell zone. And in addition, you find uh, large aggregates of uh, these red cells, which are monocytes. And I'm going to show you a zoom up of these two. Uh, comparing naive uh, samples versus CPG, which is a TLR9 agonist that induces a certain type of inflammatory signaling in the innate immune system. And again, you see repositioning of the dendritic cells and influx of these red cells, which are monocytes into the tissue. Now, um, the same kind of biology was seen not only after agonist administration uh, and immunization, but also after infection with specific uh, viruses such as West Nile virus here. And you can see again, repositioning of the green cells into the deep core of this, uh, the tissue and influx, rapid influx of monocytes here. Uh, we hypothesized, we wanted to understand the mechanisms of this and what things were doing. We hypothesized the repositioning of dendritic cells into the center was driven by chemotactic gradients. So chemokines promote immune cell homing, and one chemokine in particular promotes homing of cells into the deep T cell zone, that's CCL21. It's sensed by chemotactic receptor CCR7, and we found that after infection or vaccination, dendritic cells that live in the periphery of this lymph node increased expression of CCR7. CCR7. So then we utilized genetic perturbation models where we disrupted CCR7 signaling in dendritic cells specifically. And what we found that in contrast to wild type immunized settings where the cells rapidly move into the center of the tissue, here the cells are stuck in the periphery and in fact infiltrated B cell follicles. Now, on the functional level, dendritic cells are antigen presenting cells. They instruct activation of T cells. So we hypothesized this was important for inducing rapid cognate T cell activation so that they can undergo clonal expansion. And indeed, when we looked at compared wild type animals or animals where DCs lacked CCR7, we found that, in, so here we're looking at responding T cells. You can see these are clustered in wild type animals. They express this marker IRF4 downstream of TCR signaling. And this is largely absent in uh, CCR7 deficient mice. And KI67, which is a marker of proliferative responses, is again a diminished. And if you look several days later, there is a substantial decrease in cellular expansion. So this to us suggested that the repositioning of this dendritic cell into the T cell zone was essential for inducing T cell responses. 
Now, the other component of the, the signature of type one inflammation, as we found, we described it in these inflamed uh, lymph nodes was the appearance of monocytes within the tissue, these red cells. And uh, we hypothesized that they were expressing uh, bioactive a cytokine called IL-12, and IL-12 is essential for inducing strong differentiation of T cells into either Th1 cells and CD8 T cells to be functional effector cells. So indeed, we found that a lot of monocytes expressed IL-12 uh, in addition to dendritic cells, which is typically thought to be the major source of that. And, and when using quantitative uh, histocytometry approach, we found that if you're just comparing all myeloid cells within the tissue, if now just focusing on the IL-12 positive cells and looking inside the T cell zone, monocytes become the most dominant source of IL-12 producing cells within the tissue. I'm getting some kind of noise or feedback, uh, but okay, I'll just keep going. So why does that matter? Um, well, we, we suspected IL-12 is promoting helper cell differentiation. Um, okay, but further of interest, we found that lymph nodes after this, during these inflammatory responses were not equivalently inflamed across the entire tissue. And so what you can see here, these red inflammatory monocytes are largely infiltrating one side of the tissue and much less so to the other side of the tissue. So there's spatial heterogeneity, and you can sort of see that in quantitative space on the right here. Now, if these monocytes are providing bioactive IL-12 to the T cells, maybe we hypothesize the differentiation of T cells is distinct based on where they're going to be activated in this side or this side. And by looking at markers of, of differentiation, such as TBET, which is a factor like uh, uh, transcription factor versus TCF1, which has been associated with memory cell generation more recently, what we found is that T cells that are being educated in this side of the tissue are highly TBET positive effector like cells. While if you look at T cells on this side of the tissue, they're very much activated, but they don't express as much TBET and they express instead this precursor memory marker TCF1. And this is depicted on the spatial plot and you can see the degree of similarity here. And so you can quantify this uh, spatially using very basic region mapping and saying, well, what kind of innate cells are associated with effector T cells versus non-effector T cells? And you can see effector T cell regions were dominantly composed of inflammatory monocyte populations, less so DCs, and non-effector T cells had some monocytes, but much more composed of uh, uh, dendritic cells, which are involved in their activation. Now, this is all co correlative. In mice, that we can use functional studies we use many different types of functional studies. I'm just going to show you one type where we simply got rid of monocyte entry into the tissue using a CCR2 blocking antibody. And so here is a normal immunization setting. You have polarization of the tissue, effector inflamed sites, less differentiated effector sites. Blockade of monocyte trafficking leads to loss of this polarity and ultimately leads to loss of effector differentiation, some effector differentiation, but not as complete. And looking down the line at multiple days later, monocytes appear to be very important for this uh, effector, uh, uh, full effector differentiation process. And this is the model we put together that different, that first of all, in different innate cells come together the microenvironments change during inflammation. They come, the different innate cells come together and they mod, modulate the microenvironment to support effector cell differentiation. And the other component is that heterogeneity of microenvironments allows different priming of T cells. And this leads to the heterogeneity, at least in part to, to the heterogeneity of the adaptive immune response that we've, as a community, have been observing for quite a while. So this is at least one part of that heterogeneity dilemma, where it comes from. So now switching gears to another uh, short vignette. Uh, together, I've, we've been collaborating very closely with Kevin Erdahl and Ben, Girl, ben Gern at Seattle Children's to examine immune responses to mycobacterium tuberculosis infection using uh, cutting edge mouse models of disease. And so here uh, we, we worked on mapping the immune microenvironments in lungs. So this is a cross section of a lung, and this is a large, dense granuloma that's generated due to infection of local macrophages, and it recruits all sorts of cells, and you can see spatial or development of spatial arrangements of cells. We're now 
studying different types of granulomas, necrotic granulomas, non-necrotic granulomas, and trying to understand where that structure comes from. But we can use uh, uh, histocytometry and cytomap to be able to look at the different structures that are being generated within the lung, analyze the different types of uh, microenvironments and regions that are being formed, map these regions, study cell-cell associations, which cells prefer to live next to one another, and then use this pseudospace analysis, which is uh, essentially a linearization of all of this complex space into a, a single axis that allows you to look at cellular distribution relationships with respect to one another. Now, one interesting thing that we found on a functional level when studying interferon gamma expression by T cells, um, so maybe let me back up for one second, interferon gamma production by T cells is thought to be very important for control of mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. So, but it's limited. And we, as a community, we know it, the, something is not working quite right. Uh, and, and a lot of immune cells don't produce interferon gamma. Um, and, and so when examining interferon gamma production across infected mice and lungs, we noted that uh, T cells that are reactive to mycobacterium tuberculosis, so we know that they're specific for MTB, um, in distal lung sites, so non granuloma tissues, what we think are uninvolved tissues, uh, T cells can produce interferon gamma in the tissue, as you can see by these red uh, punctate stains, but within the granuloma microenvironment, the T cells, we, we rarely ever found any granuloma, uh, any interferon gamma producing cells, and this is quantified here. So to be able to understand what may be causing rapid suppression of interferon gamma, we hypothesized there might be some sort of immunosuppressive molecule. And uh, we isolated cells from uh, T cells that are MTB specific from either the vasculature or from within the tissue parenchyma, and then performed RNA-seq analysis to be able to then identify different pathways being induced in these responding T cells. And we identified multiple things in here, uh, many to do with effector cell, differentiation, interestingly, hypoxia within the lung, which is quite interesting of its own right. Uh, but also uh, one molecule, one molecular pathway stood out in particular is the TGF beta signaling pathway. And we, we observed significant enrichment in TGF beta uh, pathway signaling within uh, T cells that are localized within the lung. Now we then used imaging approaches to probe this further and utilized markers downstream of the TGF beta pathway, which is phosphor phosphorylated SMAD3 protein. And we found that granulomas, which is this whole entire thing, were just lit up with ongoing phosphosmad 3 indicative TGF beta signal signaling, and you can see TGF beta signaling in the nucleus of both T cells as well as myeloid cells, there's a lot of TGF beta induced induction within the granulomas, but much, much less so in the peripheral distal lungs. So this is a T cells within the distal space. You can't see really much TGF beta at all here. And we confirmed with help of Jake Estes at the uh, OHSU, we confirmed that similar patterns uh, also exist in non-humate primate granulomas of, of, of TGF beta signal. So naturally, this made us ask the question, well, is this the molecule? So now chasing the functional relevance of this predicted cell crosstalk, we have to engineer mice where T cells, but not other cells, are not able to signal via TGF beta receptor. So these are specific, we generated specific TCR, uh, uh, T cell specific TGF beta receptor knockout cell, uh, mouse lines and examine their granulomas. And in contrast to wild type animals, now the granulomas, they, first of all, they still form. So TGF beta is not the only thing that matters, but within these granulomas and TGF beta receptor uh, T cell deficient mice, there's a lot more interferon gamma producing T cells. And in fact, we were uh, uh, pleasantly surprised that the infectious burden was significantly reduced. This is a log scale, but you know it's modest, but in the field of TB, control, this is actually relatively decent control of tuberculosis. So the TB is one of these pathogens that's just hard to get rid of. And uh, to understand this, uh, how this is happening, we adoptively transferred naive T cells that are either wild type or TGF beta receptor knockouts into animals that are infected and then looked at their proliferation properties, apoptosis and interferon gamma capacity. And we found that in all settings, 
wild type cells in gray here, were be, uh, they proliferated, expanded, but rapidly lost ability to continue to proliferate and expand in number. So there was a drop in number. More of the cells were apoptotic and uh, they rapidly lost ability to produce interferon gamma while the knockout cells continued to maintain some ability to make interferon gamma. And this is naive cells, but we were able to even transfer fully differentiated effector TH1 cells that made a lot of interferon gamma. Transfer these cells into infected animals, harvest the lungs one day later, and the T cells rapidly go to the lung into the granuloma. And we found that the wild type cells were uh, much more suppressed in the ability of, to produce gamma as compared to the knockout cells and, and ability to continue proliferation. So TGF beta, in, in, as a summary, is a very, very dominant and rapid, inhib a rapid inhibitor of T cell responses, specifically within the lung granuloma. So, this is a very Impressive immune microenvironment that limits bacterial control by the immune system. And so finally, another small vignette, uh, and then I'll finish on that, is regarding uh, immune microenvironments in cancer. This is collaborative work that we did with Mario Perro and Roche Innovation Center in Zurich. Um, so this is a stylized picture of a, a, color, a colorectal carcinoma grown subcutaneously in mice. But here we were trying to understand patterns of immune cell localization in either untreated animals, uh, so this is MC38 uh, 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 cancer model, uh, or uh, treated with various types of immune uh, checkpoint blockade therapies or immune therapies or combination therapies. And so there are different varieties of responses that are being seen, and we wanted to understand what correlates with immune with a response outcome based on uh, uh, immune cell localization. So using uh, uh, Cytomap we, and, and imaging, we visualized multiple distinct tumor microenvironments or region types, and we fundamentally saw segregation of T cell rich microenvironments, these red orange regions, and uh, tumor uh, associated regions uh, here in, in uh, green and blue that had much fewer T cells. And you can see this represented on the right plots, both the XY positional space. So untreated animals had a lot of tumor regions and a lot fewer these infiltrated T cell rich regions. Uh, com combination treated animals in particular gave a robust response. And you can see that part of the tumor becomes to be highly inflamed, but not all of it. So there are residual tumor nests that appear to stay put. And so this is uh, what we thought was indicative of an ongoing immune control. And of course, you can also visualize these microenvironments uh, and the changes in, in the different treatments using uh, uh, dimensionality reduction. And so one thing, so, so here you can appreciate that across multiple animals, we can detect increase in certain microenvironment types. And so here by red and orange, these start to appear with effective therapy that correlates to decrease in tumor volume. You also see quite a bit of heterogeneity in different in individual tumors. So not every animal responds the same. You can see the error bars here are huge. And so not every animal responds the same. And we saw some heterogeneity in immune microenvironments that we observed. And so then we started to wonder whether immune microenvironments can correlate to the abundance of how well the tumor regression occurred. So this was the plot and we analyzed actually two different mouse models here, both MC38 uh, colorectal and KPC pancreatic carcinoma. And we see that except for those one outlier which had an abnormal growth, uh, in the way that the tumor established itself, but all the other animals, we found that the specific representation of, of, of tumor microenvironments that the, the T cell rich to the, the non-infiltrated was highly correlated with this uh, 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 decrease in tumor burden after immune therapy. So and why, although within the individual groups, there was a lot of heterogeneity. So this really tells you that I think that uh, this quantitative imaging can help us better understand what are the important drivers of immune control of tumor growth. Um, and so we were just wondering uh, what is leading to these microenvironments. And so looking closely at our images, we noted, noted that a lot of the, the myeloid cells that we found in particular DC, uh, certain types of dendritic cells and T cells aggregated around these structures, which are blood vessels. And uh, these were found both in the periphery of the tumor, but also within the tumor. So 
these were our hotspots of immune infiltration into the tumor, and these were associated with high degree of T cells, dendritic cells, and blood vessels. And we can map these relationships using simple distance plots. Certain types of dendritic cells are very close to blood vessels. Non-activated macrophages uh, sit further apart from blood vessels. And we also examine CD8 T cell distribution based on uh, TCF1 versus positive versus negative progenitor status. So this is is an important point in the cancer field. TCF1 positive cells are thought to be progenitor-like resource cells that generate robust immune responses to checkpoint blockade therapy. And so you can see these TCF1 positive cells sit very close to blood vessels and much more distally from cancer cells. Effector cells have a heterogeneous distribution but can, in, can get further away from blood vessels and uh, closer to cancer cells. So this together proposes a spatial model of tumor microenvironments. So tumors are not obviously uniform, they have microenvironments. And, and what we described was the existence of this perivascular immune niche composed of specific types of dendritic cells and these progenitor resource like uh, TCF1 positive CD8 T cells uh, and additional microenvironments that are further away from uh, the blood vessels, which are the tumor nest regions. And these are composed of the effector like or exhausted T cells and uh, non-activated macrophages. And so what we found was that enrichment and expansion of these perivascular niches correlates with response to therapy, and that blood vessels, we think, are the key organizers of immune cells in tumors. And I th we think the, this, the reason why blood vessels are so important is, well, uh, they pl provide a platform for uh, coordinated cell-cell crosstalk between innate and adaptive immune cells, which we know is important uh, for uh, cell function. It allows further uh, recruitment of cells from the bloodstream uh, during inflammation, so helps reinforce local uh, feed-forward loops. Uh, we think that nutrients are important for providing uh, nutrient access, so glucose and, and oxygen to cells, which we know is important for their metabolic function and ultimately uh, to how well uh, the cells can control uh, the developing progressing tumor. And so with that, I would like uh, to, uh, to end. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes over. So uh, first of all, uh, this is my group in a, a brief, uh, brief two-week period when we could remove masks and get together uh, outdoors this summer. Uh, this is Caleb Stolzfus. He developed the Cytomap uh, technology. I would also like to thank Joey, Jessica, and Karen for working on the monocyte dendritic cell story. Uh, Brandy uh, uh, here and Ramia, who's not pictured on here, uh, and Caleb worked on the tumor stuff uh, that I showed it towards the end. And Ben Gern and uh, Kevin Erdahl worked on the, uh, together with them, we worked on the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection models. And of course, my past work with Ron Germain and Wei Ji Li on the tissue clearing and histocytometry that I presented. Thank you. I'm happy to Michael. take any questions mm -hmm. for this fantastic talk. And uh, there are a couple of questions, but if you have any questions, please feel, feel free to unmute and, uh, and ask your questions directly. And maybe we can then read the uh, written questions. Um, Alex? Hi, Michael. Any questions? Yeah, great talk. I had a couple of questions for you. Um, first, uh, I, I, you, know, you have these ranges of interaction, but earlier you also showed that interesting data about specific cell types migrating more. So it seems like you know, you're well positioned to actually uh, define a range dependent on the cell type, like you've got all the data to do that. So I, I was curious if you'd explore that. And for the second question is a similar thing, but um, you, know, you show this really interesting branch like morphology, you have the you know, GCs which have their own morphology. I just wonder if you've been able to quantify those type of features in, in some you know, mathematical construct, like, a, like graph structures or, or you know, some kind of periodicity uh, metric. Hmm. Yeah, so I, to the, the second question, I mean, I think we have the tools to be able to quantify the structure uh, of the tissues and, and, and sort of the degree of the microenvironments change and the cellular composition change. We haven't really, we, we've done that for microenvironments with and without inflammation, and, and we're continuing to do that in different types of inflammation. But we haven't, you know, done a, a mathematical modeling of how that, for example, proceeds. I think uh, it, I think it's probably possible, 
uh, uh, but right now we're just trying to understand what are all the changes that are actually occurring within that tissue space to begin with. And then maybe we could, that's, a, that's an interesting suggestion. With respect to the cellular motility, um, so I think uh, this, is a, this is a very complex question uh, because a lot of the histology data, right? What the, 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 the spatial data that we are all acquiring is, is static. As soon as you essentially isolate your tissue, you are dealing with a, you know, you kill the entire system and, and studying what's happening at that given time. And th this, is a, a, this is an extremely challenging problem with respect to the immune system, because as you saw, as you commenting, is the immune cells are moving around and some cells move at different speeds and some cells uh, move at different, uh, from location A to B and the others are in, uh, have different location homing properties. Um, how do we integrate that information is I think still one of the key issues uh, and and in in thinking about the immune response, especially when thinking about T cells or B cells that are clonally expanding at the same time and are becoming heterogeneous and are moving to different compartments at different velocities, perhaps and migration characteristics. So we were talking about this a little bit before the seminar began, but I think we are going to need some new tools. Um, the current tools are basically looking at different time frames of, you know, essentially taking snapshots and samples at different time points. There are tools, for example, where you can track cells longitudinally um, uh, using either two photon microscopy, but that doesn't really give you information on their uh, heterogeneity landscape, but you can photoactivate cells for example, using fluorescence uh, uh, light illumination and turn them a different color, and then they will retain that fluorescence, for example, for a certain period of time. And that depends on how fast they proliferate, so whether they retain that fluorescence or not. And then you can isolate them later and say, what happened to you? You know, if a cell was found in this environment and then moved to a different place. But I think the answer is, fundamentally, we need new tools that allow for temporal spatial tracking of cells. If you can sort of somehow label cells based on positioning at time X and then sort of come back at a different time and analyze where they are and what they are at a different time, I think that would be a, a, a huge, huge advance in the field and how we understand the immune system. So I don't have an answer for you. We, we can only guess, I think. Yeah, I guess what, what I was suggesting maybe is that you actually have a great data set to uh, propose a more refined model of the interaction range of these cells, right? So you actually seem to have enough to at least generate a better static model. Like yeah, yeah. Static. no, and we can define that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We can define the cellular motility across a period of time. And we, we can use instead of hyperlocal interact, we can look at hyperlocal signaling of cytokines and that space has been somewhat defined. So if a cell secretes a cytokine, that can certain cytokines have a range of you know 50 to 80 microns, so that's been defined. We know T cells can move at a certain velocity, but their movement changes based on their activation state. So even in the dynamic movie, you saw the cells stop essentially aggregate around their dendritic cell, and they can hang around like that, stuck to that cell, exchanging information for a period of 24 hours. But that changes on, for example, TCR strength, and if it's low affinity, they will leave at a different time, and what the inflammatory microenvironment is, which can then impact expression of chemokine receptors that can tell the cells, get the hell away from this, this pardon my language, get away from the cell, go to an inflamed region, go talk to another cell at a different motility. Having said all that, yes, I think with using these spatial approaches, we can define a large area regions and say, in general, statistically, we think that these kinds of biological processes are going on. Um, there are some interesting tools where cell-cell interactions can tag one another through exchange of proteins on the cell membrane. And then you can sort of say, if these two cells interacted, this cell now is in a completely different area, it walked away. This is the pattern, this, this is the radius of biological activity. So, um, yeah. So if I may ask a question, 
uh, it's easy to define a normal lymph node. Uh, and I saw a paper in the, in the chat box about normal lymph nodes. But normal lymph node in a human is very difficult to define because all throughout our life, we are going to have variety of antigen responses. So is normal being defined uh, in the context of a mouse and when you take it out from a fetus or, or a nude mouse, for example? And so that's a kind of a philosophical question, but on a practical basis, we know that immunity decreases with age. Have you tried a very low hanging fruit of looking at kind of newborn mice versus uh, old ancient mice and to see what is the lymph node architecture in those because that would provide some really good insights. Yeah, I think the philosophic, I mean, these are very important, not just philosophical, but practical immunology questions. What we study for the most part in the laboratory are SPF mice of a specific genetic strain background, which is most of the studies are done on B6 background, which is has a certain tuning of immune cells to begin with, right? And this is how they respond um, to inflammatory challenges. What's known in mice that are exposed to inflammatory normal with pet from pet shop mice or, or take them from the field is that their immune system is tuned differently. And what that looks like, we don't have a good understanding of. We know the general rules of cellular organization in humans, like the T cell zone and B cells, everything seems relatively similar, but yet I just, we have not gone systematically and analyzed the distribution of all these other cell types, because frankly, we're just beginning to understand the human immune system as so much focus has been in, in terms of the heterogeneity and, and the innate cell subsets, because so much work has gone into the mouse. So I think these are kind of the, the exact questions that we will try to start moving towards. We hope to get access to human lymphoid tissues and start probing them with, with some of our uh, uh, biomarkers. And age-related questions, I think, again, you're limited with a two-year lifespan of a mouse in SPF conditions, which, again, if you generally look at a mouse at, at, at eight weeks of age, which is or six weeks when, when we receive them versus one year plus, the rules are rel roughly the same, but we haven't exhaustively studied that. I think everything does change with immune experience and, uh, you know, uh, in aged individuals, the structure of compartmentalization, stromal cell biology, all of this stuff may be different. So this is a big, big and important area that needs a lot of work in. A great presentation. Thank you. I got one question, on Ahmed. Uh, sure. uh, hey, Michael, this is a fantastic talk. Um, you know, I'm super interested in the lymph node. We, uh, uh, we, I, I work at Nanostring. I lead R and D there. We just launched a, uh, a public domain data set on human lymph nodes. Uh, it's four, uh, four different human samples at the at the whole transcriptome level, and it's interesting. I've heard the question on how, what's a normal lymph node. Uh, yeah, you know, the normals we got aren't really normal. There, I don't know if there is such a thing as a normal one, but uh, they typically come from when you do human samples. They typically come from cancer patients, and they are taking adjacent lymph nodes for what you know for all the obvious reasons. And then they quote this one is normal. So the, our study is on these so-called normal lymph nodes are uh, really probably cancer patients, and it's an adja an adjacent lymph node. But I do think there's a this is one of the most fascinating organs you could possibly look at, but there's a huge, uh, these are all whole transcriptomes, and I'd be really curious, we should get together and talk sometime about what you know about um, all the stuff that you've done, and uh, it'd be really interesting with someone with your kind of expertise to take a look at the whole transcriptome data that we put in the public domain. Um, That's really cool. Thanks for that. I, I think I just opened the link you put in the chat and I'm excited to explore that. So yeah, I'm, uh, that's wonderful that you guys are working on that. You made one little thing that I'd love to know the science behind. You said that I've been looking for cytokine, chemokine traveling distances, and you said 50 to 80 microns is something yeah. you think, uh, is, is there good data on that? Or maybe uh, you is a good paper. There are a total of three studies in mice. One of them is interferon gamma. Yeah, I can point you to that. Okay. One is the travel of interferon gamma in the skin during an infection. That's Philippe Pousseau's lab 
over five, maybe eight years ago, something like that, where they were able to use very complex bone marrow chimer experiments where they know this is the one cell that can present antigen and activate interferon gamma in a T cell. And they looked at downstream like phosphostat induction or, or signaling induction, and they defined the radius. And then the, all, the other two papers uh, were uh, from my former postdoc mentor, Roger Main's group, looking at IL-2 signaling within lymph nodes and induction of T-regulatory cell uh, activation through phosphostat-5. And there that was possible because you could pinpoint the source of interleukin-2 and study the distribution of phosphostat induction, so uh, which is downstream of interleukin-2, and you can generate, and you can visually see clouds of these cells surrounding a single IL-2 producing cell. Now, how that changes, this is steady state, how that changes during an ongoing inflamed response, and it depends on what the sink is for the surrounding cell. So if they express a lot of the receptor for that, the traveling range changes dramatically. And I think there was a mathematical modeling paper that followed that, which explored the dependencies of chemokine dispersal, how it goes out, the receptor uh, bioavailability on the surrounding cells, whether the chemokine can bind the stroma or not. So there's going to be a lot of biology there as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'll, I'll look that up. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll is the three-dimensional aspects of a lymph node or important, do you think, Michael? And then I'll and I'll I'll get I'll shut up. No, that's a great question. I you know sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. Um, I think the most critical feature of 3D aspects of this is uh, visualizing very rare cellular events that you cannot then pinpoint in thin sections. All right, or you can find one or two, but then good luck figuring out their spatial relationships to other populations. And uh, the other important part is if the cells are organized around a structurally irregular anatomical feature. So if, for example, we looked at blood vessel networks and how they talk to different dendritic cells, right? And if you look at dendritic cells on a thin section, you can see some of them localized near blood vessels, you see little clouds of them, but some of them look like generate normal clouds without any blood vessels are like, okay. But of course, when you're looking at those non-vascular associated, what we think are non-vascular associated, it's a two-dimensional plane. So there could very well be a blood vessel right above it. So the three-dimensional aspect, when we image this in 3D, we saw, oh my God, they're all swarming essentially around these irregular anatomical structures. And that then allows us to say, no, it's not heterogeneity of the cells. It's just the fact that we can't sample the tissue appropriately to be able to define the, the correct relationships. Okay, very helpful. Okay, thank but, you. But for a lot of cells, I think 2D is pretty darn good. So. Yeah. Okay, got it. A follow-up question on that is when you're looking at vessels, uh, I'm sorry to bombard you with this, but uh, I'm a pathologist, so I'm quite interested in structure of the lymph node. Uh, but do you see any relationships with high endothelial venules? Yeah, absolutely. For lymph nodes, the high endothelial venules and transitions into them, those are the most critical interactions. And so I, I, we could talk for a long time about that. Yes. Okay. And we have one more question from uh, Jeremy Kupperman in the chat. Would you like to unmute or should I read it? So the um, I can, oh, oh sorry. Go ahead, uh, yeah, I was just, I was really fascinated with this idea of the, uh, you know, the, the blood vessels organizing the, um, the immune response. And I was just really just curious, like what uh, the relevance there, you know, in the solid tumor setting when you, you know, yeah. with presence or lack of, you know, uh, uh, you know, any sort of, Vasculature and how that may play into, uh, you know, immune, immune therapies. Yeah, absolutely. So this is this is a complex topic. We just, I think, barely scratched the surface of it. Just even, and 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 it's been recapitulated by several other groups that these DC rich areas are and and uh, are in vascularized regions. And so, you know, if if I think about biologically, why this would. Be. So a pathologist would say infiltration of tumors 
happens from the outside in, right? There's the outside peripheral uh, boundary. And then if you see T cells inside, that means you have good infiltration. And I say, that's not how immune cells move around the body. Immune cells move around the body using vasculature, right? So they go through blood vessels. So the fact that we find immune cells, T cells in the tumor, but around the vascular and their perivascular cords that are being generated. And those perivascular cords of immune cells are not necessarily the deep tumor. So the deep tumor it are these tumor nests, and then you have these cords of blood vessels, and they're independent microenvironments. So you can have T cells within the tumor, but not really within the tumor. They're around the blood vasculature. How could these perivascular microenvironments be promoting immune cell function? This is speculation, but we know dendritic cell T cell crosstalk in the tumor, especially in the context of checkpoint blockade therapy, is very important for reinvigorating local responses. So we know that early activation induces induction of inflammatory chemokines or cytokines that can induce activation of the blood vessels. This could promote further recruitment of cells through the vasculature to those activated hotspots and then create a feed forward positive cascade loop sort of traveling along the blood vessels and slowly eating into those tumor nest like regions if you can sort of visualize it with me. The other concept of immune biology, this is, you know, we have a whole group of immunometabolomics people, right, that have categorized immune cell heterogeneity based on their metabolom metabolomic capacities and whether they uh, require glucose or they can survive in oxygen poor conditions or, uh, or acidified conditions. And this is true for both T cells and innate cells. They respond differently to uh, glucose and oxygen bioavailability versus, for example, low oxygen and uh, acidified microenvironments. Now, if you think about a tumor, if you're sitting right by a blood vessel, innate and adaptive cells are receiving normal, ox normal oxygenation and glucose support while cells deeper in the tissue are sensing byproducts of uh, uh, highly glycolytic uh, tumor cells that are spitting out lactic acid. And so this, we think, you know, this is again, all uh, speculation, but I think the metabolic properties and functional properties are just fundamentally tied to the spatial uh, uh, distribution profiles of immune cells with respect to blood vessels versus further away. Thank you. I think this is a great discussion. Um, and are there any other questions? I think we already learned a lot about the, uh, the lymphatic system and the immune system, and we, we can even chat more, right? <laughs> a couple of hours about it. It's a daily event. But in the interest of time, I think let's thank you the speaker again. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for this great talk. And I'm going to use this digital clap sign. <laughs> so thank you again. And this was really great. And uh, thank you so much, everybody. It was, it was wonderful to be here. And before we wrap up, well, I'd like to also announce that next week we will have Dr. Cole Trapnell, also another faculty from University of Washington. And he'll be talking about embryo scale single cell spatial transcriptomics, uh, which was published earlier this year in Science. And then with this, we'd like to thank, thank you for also participating for today's seminar series again, and we hope to see you guys next week. Please enjoy your weekend. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.